Okay, welcome to a deep dive. Today, we're doing something a little different, uh, kind of exploring the Nutanix world. And the goal here isn't, you know, just exam prep. We're actually using these questions and the logic behind them as a map. A map, I like Yeah, that. a map to uncover some really core Nutanix concepts. It's sort of like reverse engineering the platform's key ideas by seeing what they test for in practice. Makes sense. Okay. And just for context, the material mentions this exam, the NCP MCI 6.10. Let's see, 75 questions, multiple choice response, 120 minutes. Uh, English and Japanese cost about $199. Standard stuff, but like you said, the logistics aren't the point for us today. Exactly. It's what those questions imply about the technology that's interesting. Right. So let's, uh, let's unpack this and see what important nuggets these practice questions really highlight about Nutanix. Okay, so instead of just a feature list, let's look at the problems these concepts solve. You know, like the scenarios and the questions. It really shows how things fit together. Maybe start with the basics, like keeping things running. Good idea. And the material gets right into that. Uh, one of the first scenarios is about making sure a VM restarts somewhere else if its host hardware fails. Classic availability problem. That sounds like high availability, yes. HA. <laughs> it's common, but how does Nutanix handle it? Uh, according to the sources, is it different? It is, a bit. The explanation makes it clear it doesn't need complex external shared storage like, you know, traditional setups often do. It leans on their own distributed file system, NDFS. Ah, okay, so the data is already distributed. Exactly. When a host goes down, NDFS ensures the VM's data is accessible from other healthy nodes. Then the HA service just coordinates restarting that VM on one of those nodes. So the goal is fast recovery, minimum downtime, all built on that distributed shared nothing idea keeping things ticking over. Precisely. And sticking with that theme of uh, data safety in a distributed system, there's another question about setting replication factor RF, specifically RF3. Why is that important? Right. RF. Yeah. This sounds like it's about how many copies of data you keep. You got it. RF of three, the material says, means every chunk of data written gets stored in three separate places across the cluster. Three copies, okay. Yeah, and NDFS is smart about placing those copies, different nodes, different storage blocks, so it provides pretty significant fault tolerance. With RF3, the cluster can handle uh, up to two component failures simultaneously. Two failures, could be drives or even whole nodes. Depending on the setup, yeah. yeah. Without losing data or access, it's key for data safety. That's definitely robust. But RF3 means you're using three times the raw space, right? So there's a trade-off. Exactly right. More safety means more storage overhead. It's a design choice you make based on how critical the data is. Understanding that is important. Okay, so we've got VMs restarting automatically and data being copied for safety. But how do you, you know, manage all this and maybe let users do some things themselves? That seems to lead towards Prism Central. Yeah, Prism Central comes up a lot. It's their central management tool. One question specifically asks about the self-service portal within Prism Central. What can users do there? Self-service sounds like empowering users, maybe developers or departments. It is. The explanation says users can spin up VMs, but only from predefined blueprints. And they can assign resource quotas, you know, limits on CPU, memory, storage but at the project level. Ah, so it's controlled empowerment. Yeah. Admins set the templates, the blueprints, and the overall resource limits for a project. Right. And then users within that project can deploy approved configurations quickly within those guardrails. Keeps things tidy. Exactly. It gives agility, but maintains control. Crucial balance these days. And speaking of organizing things in Prism Central, another question brings up categories. What can you apply a new category to? Categories like labels or tags, essentially. Mm. The material mentions applying them to VMs and projects. Correct. They're logical tags. You could tag VMs by function, like database or web, or maybe environment like prod or dev. And I bet those tags aren't just for sorting lists, are they? Can you use them for automation or policies? You definitely can. That's the real power. You can use categories to automatically apply policies, backup schedules, security rules via flow, performance settings, just by tagging the resource. So you manage based on the tag, not hunting down individual VMs. Yeah. That's much more scalable. Absolutely. It's a policy-driven approach. Very modern. Okay, cool. So we've covered some resilience and management aspects. What about um, keeping the system itself healthy and up-to-date? That's always a big operational task. Yeah, and that brings us to a question about upgrades, specifically non-disruptive upgrades for core things like AOS, the operating system, and AHV, their hypervisor. What tool does the source recommend? It points to Lifecycle Manager, LCM, and it highlights the one-click upgrade process. 
The material stresses that LCM streamlines updating all sorts of components, AOS, hypervisor, firmware. And the crucial part there is non-disruptive. Right. LCM orchestrates it as a rolling upgrade. It moves VMs off a node, updates it, brings it back, moves VMs back, then does the next node, all automatically without taking the service offline. That kind of simplified, non-disruptive patching for a whole distributed system, that's a huge win operationally. Definitely. And staying with operations, how do you stay ahead of problems? How do you monitor proactively? Good question. Is there something for that? Well, another question points towards features called X-Play and Insights. The explanation talks about proactive management, health scores, trend analysis, even recommendations. So it's more than just like threshold alerts. Insight sounds like it's actually analyzing trends. That's the idea. Insights uses predictive analytics, looking at telemetry data, to flag potential issues before they cause trouble. It gives health scores, points out potential bottlenecks. And maybe suggests fixes. Exactly. And Xplay lets you automate responses to those insights or other triggers. So you're moving from reactive problem solving to uh, proactive health management. Kind of like an AI assistant for your cluster health. Nice. And what about looking back? For planning or troubleshooting performance over time, the material mentioned analyzing trends over, say, 30 days. Right. That would be the analysis charts feature in Prism Central. It lets you graph historical performance metrics, CPU, memory, IOPS, latency, network for the whole cluster or specific VMs or hosts. Crucial for spotting patterns, right? And for capacity planning, you need that history. Absolutely. You can't really plan capacity effectively without seeing how things have been trending over time. Otherwise, it's just guessing. Makes sense. Okay, so we've done resilience management operations. What about connecting things up and moving workloads around? Network setup and migrations. Foundational stuff. And yes, one question deals with setting up networking when you deploy HV hosts. It asks for the two essential networking components you have to configure. Hmm, two components for HV networking. The sources say you need an uplink bond and VLAN tagging. That's it. The uplink bond groups physical network ports on the host together. That gives you redundancy if a link fails. And more bandwidth for the virtual switch inside AHV, which is open vSwitch. Okay, redundancy and bandwidth and VLAN tagging. That's for network segmentation. It lets you tag traffic so VMs can connect to different logical networks, which usually map to your physical data center VLANs. You need both for a proper setup. Got it. Bond for the physical layer robustness, VLANs for the logical layer organization. Exactly. Now, what about getting VMs onto Nutanix, especially if they're running somewhere else? Like, say, moving from VMware ESX to Nutanix AHV, there's a question about that migration scenario. Ah, uh, yeah, hypervisor migration. The material recommends a tool called Nutanix Move for that specific task, ESX to AHV. Right. Move is designed to automate that. It handles replicating the VM data across, converting the disk formats if needed, and aims to minimize the downtime when you actually cut over to the new AHV cluster. Takes a lot of the manual pain and risk out of a potentially tricky migration. Mm. That's valuable. Hugely valuable, especially for modernization projects. And one last piece, sort of tying things like replication and availability together for uh, disaster recovery. There's a concept called a protection domain, or PD. What's its role? Protection domain. Mm. The source describes it as a logical grouping. You put VMs and maybe volume groups that need to be protected and replicated together into a PD. Precisely. It's the container where you define what gets backed up or replicated via snapshots, how often that sets your RPO recovery point objective, and where it gets replicated to like another Nutanix cluster at a DR site. So in a disaster, you'd activate their whole group, that PD at the recovery site. Exactly. It brings back that consistent group of applications or services together. It's really the core construct for Nutanix's native snapshot-based DR. This deep dive, using those exam questions as our guide, hopefully gave you a clearer picture of some of those core Nutanix concepts and how they tick. Definitely. It's worth digging deeper into how these pieces interact in the real world. Absolutely. Thanks for diving deep with us today.